Hi there, my name is Michael and today I'll be talking about airway compromise. Now, I think this is a very important topic because of course airway is your first letter in your A2E. So I'd hope from, from this talk you'll be able to take away some key points that you may be able to use um, in those stressful situations that you may or may not come across in your day-to-day -day practice. So um, more specifically, I'd hope that you'll be able to identify what stridor is and its significance. I'd hope that you'll be able to list down different causes of stridor and be able to use this to tailor your history as well towards um, identifying those of impending airway compromise. We'll go through some of the um, concerning signs of um, airway compromise and we'll talk about the initial management of it. So what is stridor? Um, so it's first of all, it's a red flag symptom. It's not a diagnosis. So anyone presenting with it needs an urgent review. It's caused by a narrowing of the upper airways, and this causes an area of, of turbulent flow within the airway. And that's what gives us the classical sign of an abnormally high-pitched sound that's coming from the upper airway. Classically, we learn this as occurring on inspiration. Uh, but as you can see from the diagram on the left, actually, it really depends on where it is in the upper airway. Um, so from sort of the glottis and the subglottis uh, down, um, this could present as a sort of a biphasic stridor, so both on inspiration and expiration as well. Before uh, we go on, I want you to stop the video and, be, and try and name three different causes of stridor. So the causes can be split up into the acute causes and the chronic causes. So acutely, it can be caused by foreign bodies, which is very common in children, but also in adults as well. Uh, it can be caused by trauma, anaphylaxis, infections, so that can include sort of deep neck space infections, um, but also um, infections in the, in the pediatric population, so epiglottitis or, or croup. Patients post-surgery or post-thyroidectomy can also have bleeding around uh, the larynx and that can also cause stridor or, or airway compromise. And commonly the most um, uh, the most frequent cause uh, in, in sort of a more of a chronic history is malignancy. So say you're in ED, so you've got a patient uh, whose name who is John. Um, he's a 68 year old gentleman. Um, he, he presents with progressive stridor, dyspnea and 10 kilos of weight loss over the last two years. He has sort of worsening symptoms over the last two weeks of associated hoarseness, dry cough, and dysphagia as well. He has uh, a past, uh, past medical history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes, and he's a former heavy smoker as well. So I think there's a lot you can take away from this. First is age. He's a more, he's a, he's a more elderly uh, gentleman who's also a smoker, um, but he's also had some weight loss. So that makes you think, sort of, could this be maybe a malignant cause? Um, he has those symptoms that also back that up as well. So a hoarse, hoarse voice, uh, dysphagia as well. He has had sort of a progressive stridor, so it's getting worse and indeed it can acutely decompensate. But at least this tells you maybe that at this current point in time, he doesn't you know, need a front of neck airway, for example. And it gives you a bit of a gauge of sort of how much time you might have to deal with this situation. So the history, we've covered a lot of it actually already. So it's onset and progression, I think, is the most important thing. Um, so And that gives you an idea of how much time you have to deal with this situation and who you should be calling as well. So I've got two videos here. and I just want you to observe and note down what you can see. And these are people with, with respiratory distress, uh, one in a child and one in an adult as well. And we'll go through them afterwards. So this poor this poor boy is, looks very, looks unwell. Um, you can hear an obvious what seems to be in spiritually stridor, but also he's got those signs of subcostal recession, tracheal tug as well. In other pediatric patients, you might see head bobbing too. Hey, 
So in this gentleman, he, um, you know, he's got he's got in spirit he's stride, he's leaning forward. So it looks like he's in a bit of a tripod position. He's indeed using all of his accessory muscles as well. He's got a high rest rate too. In, in, in this sort of patient, you might try to speak to them. You might find it difficult to complete his sentences as well. So you can also see cyanosis, uh, a low GCS. And your observations can also be abnormal. However, these are actually quite late signs, so you want to be able to pick those up, uh, pick up any signs earlier. Someone who is visibly tiring or has a silent chest is a very concerning sign, and you should absolutely be calling your seniors as soon as possible, really. So this is John, who we saw earlier. Um, this is obviously a uh, not a real patient, but a image I took from Google. Um, so on examination, you hear he has an inspiratory stridor using using his accessory muscles, as you can see. He's tripoding as well, and he's got a pursed lip uh, breathing too. His rest rates are high. Um, his um, SATs are low, actually, and he didn't have anything like COPD, uh, and he's got he's got diminished breath sounds bilaterally. So these are quite concerning signs for this patient. Um, his heart rate and blood pressure are okay, um, and he's able to speak to you, uh, alert and orientated, and he does look quite cachectic, so um, that, that may point to his weight loss as well, and his malignancy that he may, he may have. Um, so what would you do next? Have a little think. So to manage these patients, you need both the right people and the right environment. So absolutely, if anyone who's presenting with Stridor, call for help. Let your seniors know. So your ENT registrar, um, anaesthetist, if you're, if you're worried about, if you're particularly worried about the airway uh, being compromised, get the nursing staff around the bedside as well. Get the right environment too. So is this patient in ED? Yes. Um, so get this patient into resus, into a monitored bay, so that they can um, not, they can, be closely watched essentially for deterioration. Um, get the crash trolley nearby, know where it is, um, and put them in somewhere that has oxygen available as well. And I think it's important to be able to, be able to familiarize yourself with the below. Um, so the right people, how to get in contact with them, maybe have um, get their phone numbers before the start of the shift. Um, but also familiarize yourself with how the hospital works, how to put out crash calls, um, where the trolleys are, what sort of things are available for you as well in your particular trust. This will help in that very stressful situation to make things less stressful and have less one less thing to worry about. So when you see them, I think the first question you should ask yourself also is, does this patient require a definitive airway right now? Um, to the intubation, for example, <clears throat> um, and that will help you contact the right people. So it might range from putting the, the crash call out to contacting the anaesthetist immediately. <clears throat> um, you'd want to firstly continuously observe the patient. You want to sit the, sit them up to be able to recruit all of their lung, and you give them oxygen or Heliox as well. Now, Heliox is a mix of helium, but also oxygen as well. Um, and the helium uh, reduces the, den the, the, the density of, of the gas that you're giving this patient. So actually, it reduces the, the resistance um, that it faces in airway because it's less dense and it helps gas exchange into what is a stenosed um, airway and it goes past the, the, the blockage, essentially. So if that is available, it's great. Um, you can you can use that uh, in this situation. You'll consider um, for using things like nebulized adrenaline, which helps uh, vasoconstriction around the airway and reduces inflammation. And if you can, uh, it would be good to get IV access, both to get bloods from the patient, group and save, for example, 
uh, blood gas, but also to be able to give <coughs> steroids, which similarly reduce inflammation around any sort of um, stenosis in the airway. <coughs> with both adult and, and but also in particular pediatric patients, you want to be cautious with um, how much uh, you're disturbing the patient as well. So if you were to irritate them a lot, um, then that may, might make things worse for them. You'd want to do some further assessment down the line in the form of further um, direct imaging and, uh, and um, radiological um, scans as well.